Hi everyone, my name is Toriana Heidel. I am one of the co-chairs for the Osteopathic Schools Committee. We want to thank you guys for joining us this evening. This evening we'll be talking about our personal journeys to medical school, specifically osteopathic medicine, and you'll be hearing for from four panelists, including myself. You'll be hearing from me, you'll be hearing from Jessica, Amika, and then also from my co-chair, Claudine. She'll be a little late, but once she joins, she'll just hop right in. So the first thing is we'll have everyone um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your name, your undergrad, if you did any master's or post -backs, the medical school you go to, if you feel comfortable, your year in school, and your current specialty interests. So I'll start off. My name is Toriana Heidel. I did my undergraduate at Xavier University of Louisiana, which is a HBCU in Louisiana. As far as master's, I received the master's in healthcare administration from Louisiana State University, Shreveport. My medical school is Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Louisiana campus. And I'm currently a third year medical student. And my current specialty interests include triple board, which is pediatrics, psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry and also just general pediatrics. So Jessica, you can go next. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jessica. I um, went to undergrad at Stony Brook in New York um, and I did a master's at LECOM uh, for the master's in medical science, which kind of led me into um, getting into the med school. So right now I'm a third year at LECOM. Um, my specialty interest uh, is right now family medicine, um, hopefully like the women's health track through family medicine. Um, and yeah, I'm also a first year uh, for the dual MPH program at my school. Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Can you guys hear me? All right, my name is Amika Andrews. Um, I went to undergrad at Purdue University up in Indiana. Um, I did my master's program at Lincoln Memorial University, um, which led me into the DO program here at DCOM, DeBus College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, I am currently second year medical school, um, doing the dual program with my MBA. And um, my current interests are in um, surgery, specifically uh, orthopedic surgery, um, but I also have an interest in emergency medicine. Nice. So our next question is, um, when and how did you hear about osteopathic medical school? Because, you know, a lot of pre-meds, they either hear about it after they applied a couple of times or they have no idea that um, osteopathic medicine is a route to becoming a physician. Jessica, you can start. Yeah, um, I'm definitely one that didn't hear or didn't really know about it or I kind of fell into the trap of the stigma that surrounds osteopathic, med osteopathic medicine. Um, so I had applied twice to med school. Um, the first time I only applied to MD schools and the second time I uh, applied to DO. Um, the second time I mainly got in because of my master's program. Um, but once I started looking into DO schools, like through the application process, I realized that it actually aligned a lot with my goals that I wanted as a physician. Um, so it was just uh, my whole personal statement was kind of surrounded by um, me wanting to work with underserved populations and populations that really needed um, healthcare and just bring healthcare to everybody. So um, realizing that osteopathic medicine allows you to do that and kind of break the barriers um, with primary care and allows you to think of a patient as a more holistic lifestyle way of thinking. Um, I was really drawn to that. So I ended up falling in love with osteopathic medicine and um, yeah. That was my story. <laughs> nice. I kind of have a similar story as well. Um, so as Xavier, your freshman year, if you're on the pre-med track, you actually attend like weekly pre-med meetings. And so they gave us this packet 
and it had like MD statistics, DO statistics, but kind of like you, Jessica, I was just like, oh, I'm only going to. Okay, I'm sorry. My connection just went like blank. But um, I was saying that, so since freshman year of undergrad, I knew that osteopathic medicine was a route to a physician, but I was just so, I would say, ignorant in the fact. And so as I continued on through undergrad, and then even after undergrad, I did this program um, where we taught high school students about um, becoming a physician. And I actually toured a DO school. I toured um, NYU, not NYU, um, NYIT in New York. And so I was just like, you know, I've been hearing about this route to becoming a physician. Let me actually do my research. And like you, whenever I did my research, I saw like the mission statements for the majority of the, the DO schools aligned with my own personal interests of serving underserved communities, giving back, rural communities, primary care. So it just really all aligned, but I was running from it. And I even had my first OBGYN, she was a DO and I asked her about it. And it still just like went over my head until finally, like two years after undergrad, I was just like, okay, these are the signs that you need to apply. Um, For myself, um, I kind of had a in a way, a different experience. Um, so coming out of Purdue University, um, I knew I wanted to go to medical school, but I kind of was a little um, looking for the steps into getting to medical school. Um, so one day my advisor actually introduced me to um, an advisor at the school that I'm at now who um, showed me the master's program I knew I wanted to go into higher education. It sounded like a good program. I, I was very interested in like uh, medicine or research. So that took me to that master's program there. Um, during my time at the master's program, I came to know uh, kind of what DO medicine was. I kind of fell in love with the school and all the teachers that were there because everybody's so friendly here. So. It only made sense uh, that when it came to applying to medical school, um, I stayed at the school. So this happened to be the only medical school that I applied to. So it was kind of a, a simple process for me. I had already taken my MCAT and stuff, um, but I just came to fall in love with everything that they were doing at the school. It aligned with um, my goals in the teachers and everything. And I decided that I want to do my medical education here. So it's been great ever since. Nice. I love to hear that kind of like we all had different experiences, but it ended up leading us to becoming future DL physicians. Um, the next question is, did you apply to both allopathic and osteopathic medical schools? Um, yeah, did you apply to both? Well, Amika, you kind of already answered it. But Jessica, did you apply to both allopathic and osteopathic medical schools? And if so, wait, if so, why did you choose your school? Yeah, um, I definitely did apply both ways. Um, the first time I did just MD and the second time was both. Um, in terms of like how I went about it, I mean, I didn't have the best stats um or like the best gpa or mcat so i was like really heavily relying on what their average of like allowing people in was um ultimately like my application process didn't really matter because i did go into the masters um but yeah i think like choosing the schools i was kind of just looking at like what their mission was um how easy it was to get into because uh, unfortunately that is the sad reality of like med school is like the best school to go to is the one that lets you in because it's just so hard to get in so um yeah i did apply both kind of just like going for as many schools as possible but ultimately i think the master's program was my best shot at redoing my gpa and kind of showing that i was capable of the workload that med school requires 
As far as myself, so I applied to medical school three times. Um, and this is advice for anybody. So the first time I applied to medical school, I only applied allopathic. Um, and I would say that I didn't apply smart. Like I applied to a lot of schools. I was just like, oh, I would love to go there. Um, not really being realistic with my own stats. So my issue with medical school, well, applying to medical school was the MCAT. My GPA was fine. I had the extracurriculars, but me and the MCAT had a struggle going on. So I didn't apply for SMART the first time. And so like I retook the MCAT and like I actually dropped points. So I was like, oh snap. So I just reapplied again. And then the second time I even still got an interview um, at a DO school. I applied both, but they were like a conditional acceptance. And with the... um conditional acceptance they wanted me to retake my MCAT so I was like no I would rather just study hard and retake the MCAT so that um, I could be more competitive the next time and so in doing that that was my third time applying to med school I had three interviews but I didn't go to my last one because I had got accepted to the school I'm currently at and I was just confident in like the curriculum. I like the school. I like the vibe. So for anybody out there, I would definitely suggest being very smart and strategic when you're applying to medical school, whether you're applying to just osteopathic medical school, whether you're applying to allopathic or whether you're applying to both. It's very important that you look at stats, you look at mission statements, you look at things to see if this school will even align with like what you want to do when you get old, when you finish medical school and if you have a realistic chance of even getting accepted. And hi, Claudine. Um, Claudine's now joined us. She is um, the co-chair to my co-chair of the Osteopathic School Committee. So Claudine, we'll let you introduce yourself with like your name, undergrad, any master's, medical school year, and current specialty interests. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? All right, my name is Claudine. Um, I am currently a fourth year at PCOM in Philadelphia. I went to Rutgers for undergrad um, and I'm currently applying internal, not sorry, family medicine. I didn't do any masters or anything like that. So I went straight from undergrad to medical school. And I'm about to bombard you with the questions we already <laughs> answered. Just, just in case people wanna hear your input. Uh, when and how did you hear about osteopathic medical school? Um, it's interesting because I actually didn't know about osteopathic medicine until I um, was at Rutgers for undergrad. It was my freshman year. I was a part of a program called Odasis um, for like underrepresented students to help them in um, the field of STEM. And we went to a trip at Rowan University's osteopathic medical school. And that's kind of where I learned about OMM um, and like OMT, the tenets of osteopathic medicine. That's kind of where I, I um, fell in love with it. And did you apply to both allopathic and osteopathic medical school? I did. Um, so when I was applying, my MCAT score wasn't great. So I actually only applied to very few schools. I, you know, I did my research. I try to be smart about the whole process. I applied to three MD and three DO schools. And what made you choose your med school? Well, I like I tell everyone, my med school chose me. So PCOM was actually the only school that gave me an interview. And I think um, it turned out the way it's supposed to be um, because I really felt like I belonged when I got here. My interview was like, it was amazing. It was kind of crazy because the lady who, had, who interviewed me was someone who I met when I did a um, summer program at Cooper like two summers prior. And she was my mock interviewer. So it was kind of crazy that she was my actual interviewer this day of my interview. And the interview, I don't know, it just felt like I belonged there. So I was glad to be there. Nice. So for everyone, um, I know some of you guys did master's programs, but how early did you submit your application to school? And around what time did you have an interview? So even if you did a master's program, kind of like how does that look if you do a master's program at your osteopathic school? And Amika, you can start. Well, uh, it definitely depends if you're doing a master's or you're not doing a master's. Um, I wouldn't be able to speak on 
the timeline if you weren't doing a master's, but I can tell you if you were doing a master's. So my school um, at the time they had um, certain contingencies. If you had a certain GPA, like over 3.7 for the master's and a certain score on your MCAT, uh, maybe being like 500 or something like that, they guaranteed that you would be able to get a interview at the school um so basically with the masters they kind of help you through that process because you it, the masters is under the medical school so basically we have the same professors we actually took some of our first year classes with the medical school we we're actually i actually ended up finishing four medical school classes in my master's year so i didn't have to retake them my first year which was good but um by the time January came around, grades came out, um, I happened to hit those scores. And so basically they came to me and was like, uh, we need to give you the interview because you have the scores and stuff. So like, hurry up and get your stuff in because like it's guaranteed. So like, don't be late. So they kind of pushed me into, um, getting the interview, um, even though I was a little behind with my application and stuff, just because school was so busy the first semester. Um, and so they were like, hey, we have to offer it to you. By March, I interviewed. Um, by April, I figured out I was in medical school. Um, for our school, though, I think uh, the late deadline might be somewhere in February, if you weren't in like the master's program but definitely for the master's programs uh if the school has like a plan to get you into medical school um they work with you and they create a timeline for you so they're basically helping you put that together before uh, your time comes thank you how about you jessica yeah um the, when I did apply, I, I definitely was a lot later than I should have been. I, I think I was doing, I, my understanding is that you're supposed to get the applications in like during the summer and then you kind of work on secondaries. I was kind of working right up to the deadline. Don't do what I did because if you think about it of like a pool of applicants, like you don't want to be the bottom of the pile. So early you can get it in is better. Um, in terms of like my master's, um, I, I think I started in 2019, um, and so it was similar for us where if we reached a certain GPA, uh, we would get an interview, and that interview was kind of around January, um, but it was with all the professors that we had already had classes with. Um, our program was also uh, like basically the first two years of med school condensed into a, a one-year master's. Um, we still had to take all the same classes again, um, but it uh, it was nice to be able to get to know the faculty. And then um, the interview, like nobody really took quote unquote seriously because, you know, it was just um, a courtesy at that point. It really what they were looking at was your grades and your MCAT of like whether you could hold yourself up to the standards of the medical school curriculum because it was so closely related. So, um, yeah, I, sorry, I can't talk much more about like the actual process because I didn't really do very well for the actual application part, but um, in terms of the masters, that's how mine worked. What about you, Claudine? So like I didn't do a master's, but in terms like the application process for me, um, I kind of su I submitted it pretty early. I feel like I submitted my applications in like end of June, beginning of July. Um, so I wanted to get everything like in pretty early because I knew like everyone's going to be submitting. It's kind of everything's on a rolling basis. So I wanted to be among the first that they um, you know view the applications, um, but. It was a long waiting process for me. I didn't hear back until I want to say January, um, and I didn't have my interview until February. So it was a pretty long waiting process. So I'll speak on all three of the times I applied because they were all kind of different. So the first time I said I only applied to allopathic medical school and I applied pretty early, you know, like they tell you apply early. I think I had got my MCAT back 
in like July, maybe. No, I got my MCAT back in like August. So I had already submitted my application um, and just was waiting for my MCAT score. And again, I don't think that's smart because until you get your MCAT score back, you've applied to all these medical schools. And depending on your MCAT score, that kind of like already knocks you out the ballpark. And so I received two interviews um, to allopathic schools in my first go round applying to medical school. Um, and they both were in the spring, I think. One was to Howard and I got that in like March, maybe. And then I had an interview to LSU New Orleans and that was kind of like April. So very late. Um, and so I got waitlisted at Howard and then denied at LSU. The second go round again late because my, my MK had dropped, but I still applied anyway. Um, the second go round, I got an interview in... I think like March again, <laughs> and that's when I got the conditional acceptance in the summer. And then the last time when I finally got into med school, um, I applied to a Texas school because I had moved to Texas. So that's another thing. Texas does have DO schools too, but it's a separate application for some of them besides a Comus. And we'll talk about that later too, like the differences between the allopathic medical school sites and the osteopathic medical school sites for applications, letters, et cetera. So for Texas, everything is super early. Like you find out in January if you like got into medical school. So for Sam Houston, which is a newer DO school in Texas, I got an interview in November. So I had the interview in November and then in January, I hadn't heard back. So I was like, well, I guess I didn't get in. And then for my current school in BCom, I hadn't heard anything by like November. So at this point, this is my third application cycle. I'm getting nervous. So I emailed um, one of the deans there and I was just like, hi, I submitted an application. Can I talk about like my chances or what do you think that I can do to improve if I don't get in this time? And he literally was just like, if you don't hear anything back by January, send me another email because he had already reviewed my application once I had emailed him. And literally in January, I sent him an email and I was like, hey, I haven't heard back. And literally the next day I got an interview. So this is a notice to say, like, plug yourself in. Like, if you know the deans or and I really didn't know him, I just had found his email from my undergrad that had sent like an email out. If you know these people or even the people on that admissions committee, message them and see kind of like, what can you do to improve? You know, like what can you do to make you a more competitive applicant? And you just never know where that'll take you because you might be competitive and they just haven't gotten to your application yet. But like if you send an email, they may look it over and next thing you know, you may have an interview. So always advocate for yourself and don't count yourself out. That's my biggest advice for anyone applying to medical school is that like sometimes you may need to send that email and it may just change your life. Yeah, so, I just want to piggyback okay. off of what Toriana is saying. I totally agree with that because even for me, when I was waiting on my interview um, from PCOM, I had to email not once, a couple of times, maybe three times or maybe four times or so. Um, just, you know, just again, stating like your interest in a program. And if you have any updates to your application, because once you submit, you can't really update it. So if you did like any um, shadowing or like you have any um, new grades, you want to send that stuff to them over email so they can add it to your application. That might help you to get an interview. So always um, reach out. My next question is, what type of extracurriculars, leadership, or research was on your application, whether you applied to the master's program or straight to medical school? Like, what did you do, whether it's in undergrad or after undergrad, if you took a couple of years off, what did you do to, like, make yourself stand out and show you were interested in medicine? And anyone can start. Uh, well, for myself, I'm really big on community service. So um, I actually grew up with my dad doing a lot of community service in other countries. So um, I've done a lot of like medical mission trips. And then while I got into college, I also joined uh, MedLife, which does med uh, medical mission trips. So we would go to like Lima, Peru, out of the country and go do uh, medical clinics for a couple of weeks under some doctors. So um, 
that was kind of a way that I showed my commitment to that. I also kept up with my community service uh, during college as much as I can through um, different organizations. Um, so I did that. And then what else did I do? Oh, so I was a scribe also. Um, I did medical scribing in the ER for a couple of years. Uh, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. So um, I was a medical scribe in the ER down in Texas. That um, helped me to meet a lot of doctors who uh, were very instrumental in writing a lot of um, of the application papers and letters that I needed to get into medical school. So um, always build those communications. Um, I can go. So for me, I did a lot of um, leadership kind of stuff. So I was a part of different organizations um, and I was leader, a leader in a leadership role in a lot of them. That's something I've continued doing even throughout medical school is something I'm like passionate about. I did a lot of mentoring and tutoring for students, which is something I've also <laughs> continued doing. Um, I honestly didn't do like a lot of shadowing and stuff. To be honest, I didn't have much of that on my application. Um, I I don't know. I feel like I did a lot of different things in undergrad, which kind of made me like a well-rounded applicant that is, wasn't necessarily within medicine because you don't have to, like to get into medical school, you don't have to do everything that's like just medicine focused. They want to know you like as a person, individual, because you're still someone outside of medicine. Um, so I think that's what, most of my applications show, like I was a part of a gospel choir, a dance group, and that was honestly what most of my interview was about, me dancing and singing, believe it or not. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also um, did a lot of leadership, um, mainly because I was really quiet in high school, so it was important for me to push myself out of my boundaries. And um, I assumed a lot of leadership positions um, to kind of like gain the skills that I thought I would need as a provider. Um, but they weren't very medically oriented. They were kind of just topics that I was interested in. So like the neuroscience club or like active minds. And um, I also thought it was like important for myself to just be interested in what I was doing, because if I was doing it just for like the checklisting of being able to get into med school, it wasn't going to mean as much to me or I wouldn't get as much from it. Um, so yeah, I mainly did things that I was interested in, um, in terms, I did take a gap year after I graduated and I worked at a preschool for kids with disabilities. Um, and that was my most favorite, uh, experience so far, just working with kids and seeing, um, the other side of like, um, working with kids with disabilities. I had originally wanted to be a provider for those kids. Um, but seeing like the other side of being a teacher, a caregiver, um, it really changed how I saw how families were affected, how caregivers are affected, um, and just how kids like grow and develop. And uh, it was really cool to see that side of it. So um, yeah, I agree with everything that everyone said so far. And the biggest advice I can give is just do something that you're interested in. Because if you're doing it for the sake of getting into med school, it kind of takes the fun out of it and you won't really be able to grow from your experiences. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, so I was a busybody. Um, I also did, I did an eight week clinical internship in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So that was one of my favorite things I did in undergrad, like studying abroad. And it was a clinical experience. I got to see kind of like global health on a larger scale. And I was able to kind of compare the underserved communities I was used to seeing in my own state to um, underserved global communities and like the differences and similarities. I also had a lot of leadership roles. I was on the SGA in undergrad as treasurer and then secretary. And then I continued that to my medical school. So for my medical school, I was, um, well, I am a part of the inaugural class at my campus. Um, we have four campuses, Louisiana being the last one, uh, well, the most recent one. So I was like the inaugural SGA treasurer. So like the things I, were inter I was interested in in undergrad, I continued those things in medical school. And I am continuing those things in medical school. Um, 
funny thing is I was a part of MAPS in undergrad and I didn't even know it was in conjunction with the SNMA. I didn't even realize that or make that connection until my freshman year, not freshman year, my first year of medical school, whenever I got involved with the SNMA and I saw MAPS and I was like, wait, this rings a bell. So you just never know how things are connected until like kind of after the fact. But I also did every summer, if you're in undergrad, this is perfect. So every summer I made sure to kind of like utilize my summers and do different summer programs. Um, and they all paid me. So that was good. You know, like in undergrad, you really don't have that much money. So the summers, I kind of got like a two for one. I was able to see different areas of medicine, but also get kind of like a little stipend. So that was literally perfect. The one that I did was, um, it was SMDP at the time, but now it's called SHPEP, like S-H-P-E-P. -E and they're at multiple um, colleges of medicine, ranging from like UVA to Yale to Howard so I think UTMB and Galveston. So they're like literally at so many different medical schools and it's for medicine and dentistry. And I think at the time they paid us maybe like $500. It may be more now, but that program literally introduced me to so many people I'm still in contact with now who are now physicians, dentists, pharmacists. So my best advice is if you're in undergrad now or even out of un undergrad, look for those opportunities where you can kind of confirm if medicine is for you before you get to medical school, because it's a hard journey. So I think it's important to kind of know, like, what are you getting yourself into? Is this something you really, really want to do? And the best way to do that is to do those summer programs. It's a short period of time. And it lets you know early on if you can see yourself doing that or if you may want to check out dentistry or if you may want to check out pharmacy. So that's my best advice. Look up those summer programs. It's so many out there. They're research-based, community service-based, internship-based, and they will pay you. So that's great. The next question is, what is something you wish you knew about osteopathic medicine before applying to medical school, if anything? And anybody can answer. I guess um, kind of like what we touched on earlier, I, I guess I wish I knew a little bit earlier what the focus of osteopathic medicine was. I feel like... Um, the branding approach for Diaz is not the best. They kind of say like it's holistic and mind, body, spirit. But I think it's a lot more than that. It, it's really just about um, you just have like a different way of thinking and a different like you have different differentials when it comes to like back pain. Right. And you have a different treatment approach because you're not immediately thinking surgery or medications. You're thinking what manipulations can I do? And I wish I like knew a little bit more like what OMM meant and what it would mean for like um, underserved populations, because especially in like underserved populations, people are working more physical labor jobs. And so being able to be a provider that can provide um, patient education on like stretching and manipulation techniques, I think can go a long way. And I kind of wish I knew earlier that it wasn't just about getting into like med school. It like an easier route to getting into med school, it was also about like, does it align with your goals as a provider, a future provider? Um, I can go. I don't know if there's anything that I wish that I knew, but um, I would say along my journey, especially now about to graduate and start actually practicing, um, one of the things that I'm really glad and that I've witnessed or seen throughout my journey is that you can really use osteopathic medicine or OMT um, for different populations. So including newborns, pediatric patients, adults, um, people with just different conditions. So it's useful in so many different ways. So it's been really cool to learn that, be able to do it, and now be able to practice it. So for me, um, I wish I knew early on, um, and it doesn't affect me, but I guess if it would have affected me to like do research, if I would have wanted to say, for instance, go into like 
urology or something. I think that's important for you guys. Um, and you may not know what specialty, but I do think it's important to know that there is um, some specialties that like kind of favor deals. And there's some specialties that not to say it's impossible, but it may be a little harder to get into. For instance, there's a plastic surgery um, intern I follow and she went to Pecom, Georgia. And it took her a little while to get into residency, you know, and I don't think she would have changed anything about her journey. But that's something to know ahead of time, you know, like maybe looking at match data to see kind of like how many DOs match into ophthalmology or urology or plastic surgery. If that's some of the things that you think you may want to go into, because it could be a harder route for you um, compared to others, because those specialties are already competitive, whereas with orthopedic surgery, um, I know a lot of DOs who get into orthopedic surgery because of our knowledge of the musculoskeletal system. You know, we go in there, um, whether it's a rotation or a way, and we're able to shine because we're so used to knowing about the muscles, about OMT, and kind of, you know, like giving a different perspective, like Jessica said, to like treatment and the approach to patients. So that's one of my biggest advices is that if you know for a fact that you um, want to go into these super, super competitive, not just anything, but like something super, super competitive, you may want to consider going to allopathic medical school, or you may want to just be realistic and know that you may have to work a little bit harder to get into that specialty. You may have to take both the USMLE and Comlex. You may have to take a research year. You may have to just do something a little bit extra to get where you need to be. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think everyone's journey is crafted for them. So it just all depends on your own timeline. You know, we all have our timelines, but it never really goes how we want. But it depends on your own timeline and kind of like what you want to do. Uh, I would say for myself, um, for me, since my journey's been a little different, I wouldn't say that I would want to per se know anything before getting to DO school, but like they kind of mentioned, um, it does add something extra to you um, that a lot of MD and allopathic schools don't get. Um, a lot of their time isn't spent as much as we are just being hands-on. Um, a lot of our time is spent with osteopathic medicine, being able to, like they say, know the body top to bottom, but we felt it. We've used our hands to diagnose a lot of stuff. So that if you take your time with it, you actually take your time to learn it and appreciate it. Um, that puts you well ahead because I can go out into my community when I'm at home or around my friends or anything like that and, you know, start to feel for some of these abnormalities in people that have back problems, knee problems, and the sacrum, anything like that. I can do that as a student, um, whereas a lot of other students at MD schools are going to have to learn how to do specialized stuff like that later down the line, um, closer to residency, fourth year when they're actually rotating. Um, we are getting that ability now. So in a way it puts you ahead. Um, it definitely does put you ahead. And so I can really appreciate that and that I have that extra bit of knowledge. And so, you know, saying that I want to go into orthopedics. Um, I do know a lot about the musculoskeletal system just based off of osteopathic medicine itself. And so, you know, in a way that puts me ahead in my knowledge. And so that's pretty cool to know that I've gotten that. Our next question is, what do you like about your medical school or curriculum that you believe will benefit you as a future physician? Basically, just brag on your school. <laughs> um, I would say the one thing that I really do like about this school is that um, here, everybody's kind of like a family. 
Um, it isn't crazy competitive where everybody's kind of out for themselves. And, it, you know, being a, a black student myself, I'm first generation and I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm in the middle of Tennessee right now, in like the middle of Tennessee. So I'm far away from home. I uh, don't have too many people around me um, that I would say are family, per se, blood. But I have a bunch of students here that treat me like family. Um, I talk to them, I hang out with them, I hang out with my professors, we play sports together. We go and watch sports games. I know them by name, we laugh together, we hang out. So that's really taken off a lot of load off of medical school for the basic fact that every day I go to school, it's it doesn't feel like I'm too far away from home. And so that eases the stress of medical school. So I think that's the best part here. It's definitely a family environment. And when you're looking for a medical school, you definitely want to be somewhere where you feel comfortable. So um, that's a big, a big green flag for me. Um, I can go. So for me, I would have to agree with um, Emeka about the community here at PCOM, which is actually one of the reasons why, I mean, other than them choosing me, which is why I kind of applied. I knew one or two people coming in. Um, they were upperclassmen, so they graduated by at this point. Um, but it was, it felt like a family. Um, and also, um, I felt like the faculty were really supportive of these students. Um, we have open door policies. If you ever struggle with any topics or like any help with any lectures or anything, they you can just go and like talk to them. You don't need to make an appointment or anything like that. Um, also, the location is great. It's in Philly. Well, it's kind of like outside of Philly. They call it like fake Philly, but um, it's right outside the city. So there's like a lot of things to do around here. So great location. Um, and yeah, it just it's really positive vibes. So for my school, we have four campuses, um, one in Auburn, Alabama, one in um, Blacksburg, Virginia, and one in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And my school is in Monroe, Louisiana. So strategically, my school built, well, my school system built those locations because of the Appalachian region. Um, they're known to have like a lot of underserved populations, people with rural health care who don't really have access to um, physicians. So that was really cool about my school, knowing that I would be in an area where we could be of service and of need. Just for instance, like Louisiana, you guys know about the hurricanes. So when one of the hurricanes passed, um, my school was able to go to one of the convention centers and help out for people who had been displaced from their homes in different parts of Louisiana. And also my absolute favorite thing about VCOM, whether you go to any of the campuses, is the curriculum. The curriculum literally sets us up for so much success. We have a systems-based curriculum. And the first system, of course, is like intro information. But every system after that, you're learning everything about it. And it's different classes. So for a minute, it kind of reminded me of like undergrad. And I can give an example. So for the musculoskeletal system, we learned pharmacology. We learned physiology. We learned um, pathology. And all of those were different classes. So we didn't have to worry really about like, if I have this one big test and I don't know the farm, will it affect my grade? No, you had your pharmacy test and you knew if you struggled in farm that you may have to grind a little harder to do well on this pharmacy test, but the grade didn't affect any of your other courses. And we also have clinical medicine incorporated into every block. And now as a third year, I can single-handedly say that it came so clutch. Um, clinical medicine is where basically everything ties together. So you're learning things from a clinical approach, whether it's MSK, OBGYN, et cetera. So looking back for my OBGYN um, rotation I just finished last month, my preceptor was surprised I knew all of these OBGYN um terms and 
I guess, presentations because most medical schools don't have that. So when she asked me questions, I was able to spit it off because I had saw it. I had saw it in physiology. I had saw it in clinical medicine. I had saw it in pharmacology. So it's kind of like constant repetition where that clinical medicine just kind of like ties everything together, telling you what's the best step, what medicine do you need, what actually is, um, for instance, placenta previa, you know, like besides seeing it from a physiology perspective, you're now looking at it from a clinician perspective, which sticks. Like you'll be surprised how much the information sticks and how important it is for board exams. Because board exams, you kind of have to know what disease process it is before you can answer the question. It's not just going to be like, well, sometimes it is, but sometimes you need to know it's placenta previa and you need to know the physiology behind it or you need to know the management. So that's my favorite thing about my school and the curriculum is just having that extra clinical medicine component of every system so that whenever you do go into boards or third year, you're not blind and you're not thinking about it so sciencey that you can't break it down to your patient's level because that's important. You can't go in there speaking these big terms because your patient's not even going to understand what any of that is. You have to be able to speak it in layman terms so that everyone understands and that everyone's on the same page. Yeah, um, I think for my school, I'm not really sure how rotations work in other schools, but um, at least for mine right now, I'm in a rural site, um, specifically at a VA. So it's been really interesting to see um, the veterans population and kind of what their health care needs are. But also from a rural perspective, um, the limitation of resources and how it affects health care has been really interesting. Um, and I kind of like that my school has like places here. We do have like a lot of um, different sites throughout like New York and Pennsylvania that they've placed us throughout. Um, but a lot of these sites are rural and underserved communities um, so that we can get a feel for what the healthcare is like here. So um, even with that, the fourth year um, is a lot of electives. So we get to choose where we want to go. So if I want to see what urban medicine is like or you know, go back home and work at an office, private practice near there, I could, I have the freedom to do that. Um, and I do like that about my curriculum where I kind of have a choice as to the type of medicine I want to see. Um, and from there, get a better perspective of like who I want to be as a physician, where I want to settle down. Um, and even more opportunities just for auditioning and getting to know people at hospitals that I would potentially want to apply to. So I like that about my school. Okay, so we're going to ask one more question. Well, no, two more questions. Um, and then we'll just kind of explain. Well, I'll explain like current application guidelines, what websites um, you, that are useful for applying to osteopathic medical schools um, and kind of like what the current statistics are. So do you plan to use OMT in your future practice? Why or why not? I can start since um, about to um, graduate. Um, so yeah, definitely I do plan to use OMT um, because when I'm really a hands-on kind of person um, and I also believe from the attendance of osteopathic medicine, I think there is a lot of benefit to it, like I spoke about earlier for different populations. For me specifically, I would like to use it <clears throat> on all my patients, but more so on my pregnant patient population, um, because I think that it can have some benefit to them. You know, in pregnancy, there's, there's a lot of fluid buildup and they get like a lot of edema and things like that. So doing some kind of like lymphatic um, um, treatments can help with that and just different things that can benefit pregnant women. And I don't think that it's used enough in that patient population because the yeah, idea is in a lot of studies, but there is one study that has been done that promote study and it has showed that it actually is very useful in that population. Um, so in short, yes, I would be using OMT. <laughs> I agree. I definitely will be using OMT in my future as well. Um, I think it just opens the door for patient education, like even with my own family members, teaching them stretches or like um, like techniques that they can use to get rid of their pain. A couple of days later, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that worked. It's like, yeah, that's all I'm at. And so I'm, I'm excited to use it in my practice um, just to open the door for conversation with patients about health ownership.
Um, I think I definitely will use the principles of osteopathic medicine um, just for the simple fact that it does open up your eyes to uh, another world of medicine. Not everyone is going to be able to afford surgery. Um, we can't, everybody's not going to be able to get all these expensive medications. Um, right now with orthopedics, I'm kind of interested in like spine surgery. Um, I've gotten to work at a, a spine hospital um, over the summer and do a lot of research in spine and stuff. So I do understand that um, it's not always the best option to do those surgeries on a lot of patients. And knowing osteopathic medicine, and if you ask me, I feel like treating back pain with osteopathic medicine might be the easiest thing we've learned in osteopathic medicine. It is quite, it is not simple, but I can do it. So, um, I think that will very much tie into some of my goals that I have for the future, especially if I do want to go into spine or anything with MSK, I feel like that is a bunch of osteopathic stuff. And if you're thinking about going back to serve in a rural or underserved community where you're just not trying to have everyone pay for stuff and you're trying to make a real impact by just helping decrease morbidity, which is sickness or how far something progresses. Um, I think that your first step is to be able to evaluate a patient um, top to bottom and give them those options before you say, I just want you to go and figure out a way to get this medication or you're going to get sicker or you say, I want you to have this um, surgery or basically the ending of that is you're going to get sicker. So I very much think that uh, osteopathic medicine does kind of help gap that. So we're not just having this big disparity in medicine that we're already seeing. Nice. I like that. Um, I want to work with PEDS. So um, I definitely think that I will use it in my practice, especially like for, you know, kids get sick. So like um, sinuses, of course, that's a big thing. Um, lymphatic drainage. I definitely plan on using with kids. You have to kind of be careful with some of the muscle energy, um, which is an OMT technique if you want to Google it. Um, and definitely HVLA, you got to be careful with that in kids. But um, at this past year's AMEC, make sure to go to AMEC 2023. At this past AMEC, um, a pediatrician who's actually a program director, he showed me like some techniques that he does on children. So it was nice to, well, he actually demonstrated it on me, but it was nice to see that those techniques that he showed me can be used on P on the peace population because like when it comes to kids i'm kind of like mm, hesitant because they're like kind of fragile but kind of not fragile so when he was just showing me the techniques and how much force he uses or the things that he does to compensate for maybe kids not following directions and things of that um nature um I definitely want to use it. And then also kids have injuries too, whether you're a general practitioner, you know, kids are coming in with knee pain, with foot pain and things of that sort. All of those things can be used or can be treated with OMT if you find a somatic dysfunction, which most likely you will because everyone has some form of somatic dysfunction. And my last question for you guys is, well, not question, but give um, those tuning in some advice, what advice would you give them knowing what you know now at your current stage of um, being a medical student, whether it's one word, a couple words, a couple sentences? Um, I think this is what I tell <clears throat> all my mentees and I try to tell myself every day, um, give yourself grace. Um, I think it's really easy for us to give grace to other people, but we're really hard on ourselves. So whether or not you are or you are not where you want to be along this journey, um, give yourself grace, um, reward yourself for, you know, 
appreciate how far you have come, how hard you've worked to get to where it is that you are and know that it's not the end. Even if you haven't accomplished what you want to accomplish yet, just keep going, seek out um, mentors, um, you know, keep doing research, keep trying. Even if you fall, keep getting back up and eventually you will end up where you're supposed to end up. Uh, yeah, just to piggyback off of that, um, always keep pushing forward, um, knowing story. I don't even like to listen to everybody else's story of how they got there. You take advice, you always take advice. Um, and, you know, that helps you like ease out your pathway, but comparing different stories or how many interviews someone got versus you not getting in, it's only meant to kind of put you down in a way because you're comparing um, no one's story is going to kind of be the same as in for me uh i almost had no idea how i was going to get to medical school i knew i wanted to be a doctor but like i said i'm first generation so my parents didn't have the answers i wasn't really put around people who had most of the answers all i did was just kept walking forward and figuring out what i need to do um, at some point i was introduced to the right people i took the right steps and eventually i ended up at medical school you know this was my only medical school that i applied to and my only mcat uh so my story is not going to be like yours or the next person's but it's just to say that you have no idea where you're going to go but if you really want it and you want to go to medical school it all works itself out you just have to keep working and keep taking the steps and take your time it doesn't have to get done by tomorrow we're all different ages we're all going to finish medical school at different ages going to different specialties so it's all just a personal journey it's just up to you of how you want to take your journey and where you want to be at the end so just keep going and you'll get it yeah i agree with that um it's, it's kind of like everybody is running their own race and you just need to like keep focused on yours and what you're doing it can get really easy to kind of like turn online and ask like do i have a chance of getting in and then everybody's like no chance at all um but like it, it really just matters about like you at the end of the day if you're passionate about it you, you this is the only thing you can imagine yourself in like um things will happen the way that they're supposed to happen and i think um also just doing things that you're interested in like um this process can take so much out of you and it can be very anxiety inducing, but having that little bit of like something that you're passionate in, something that you really enjoy, um, even if it's not medically related, I think can go a long way and you need to take care of yourself at the end of the day, because this is a really long journey. And if you don't put yourself first, it can, you're just not going to have as much fun and, um, you might lose sight of why you're actually doing this in the first place. So I think, um, like you guys said, it just putting yourself first it is the best thing you can do. My favorite advice to share with people is to go where you're um, celebrated and not tolerated. I'm like a firm believer in that. Um, also, I'm a firm believer in like life works itself out. Um, this was the only medical school. Of course, I declined an interview, but this was the only medical school I got into. And it just worked itself out. Like, I'm so happy I came here. Um, I feel like I'm at the right place at the right time. So, um, like Amika was saying, comparison is the, is the thief of joy. You want to make sure, you know, to run your own race, to do your own thing, to reach out for help if needed. That's a big thing about, you know, like being on this journey and sometimes feeling like a failure, you know, people don't want to talk about that, but, you know, constantly not getting into medical school, or maybe when you get into medical school, filling classes or filling board exams, you know, at one point you may feel like a failure. Um, and it's nothing to be like a, ashamed about, you know, it's important to know like when and why you need to reach out for help if needed, because someone may have just a little tool that may help you succeed. So, 
keep trying, keep going. Um, don't give up on yourself because there are future patients out there who need you, who need people from minority communities to have the inspiration that we look like them, that they feel welcome, you know, that they feel understood. People who come from first generation backgrounds like myself, like Amika, um, to know that we care about them, you know, that we're not just there to collect a paycheck. That's all important. And also just remembering your why. If it's something you really, really, really want to do, and if you feel like this is what's been called for your life, then it's going to happen. It may not happen on your time. And that's hard to reason with. Um, speaking personally, it was hard to reason with whenever I felt like, man, I should have been in medical school or people got the same stats as me, but it wasn't my time. It wasn't my season. You know, like I got into medical school at a place from my home state, the first DO school in Louisiana. Louisiana was the last state to even allow DOs to practice. You know, I'm an NHSC scholar. So, you know, like all type of things just started happening for me, not on my time, but like on a bigger time scale. So just believe in yourself, choose yourself, um, and everything will work out. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in a the chat. I saw we had a question about like where you can learn more about like becoming a DO and OMM. Um, I recommend the chooseDO.org website. It tells you about kind of like how to apply to medical school, um, the different medical schools that are out there, and kind of like what the stats are. So for reference, in 2021, the average science GPA was 3.51, non-science 3.69, and overall GPA 3.59. In 2001, the total MCAT average was a 504.89. So to me, that kind of rounds up to like a 505 MCAT score. You need the same um, prerequisites as an allopathic medical school. You need one year of biology, one year of physics, one year of English, two years of chemistry. However, like allopathic medical schools, um, you would need to look on that specific College of Osteopathic Medicine website because some may require, you know, like maybe sociology or a physiology, you know, just to make sure that you're meeting the requirements of those schools you are interested in. Additionally, um, something that's good about um, Osteopathic Medical School is the deadlines. Um, they are much later. Like Jessica mentioned, she applied a little later. She didn't like recommend it, but the option is it's November. And if you're seeing like, maybe you're not getting those interviews that you want, or maybe like you just got your MCAT score back. And you're trying to decide if you're competitive or not. Um, for the most part, the majority of DO primary um, applications are due in April and March. There's a few that's due in January and February, but some are like April 1st, March 1st, and that's for primaries, whereas secondaries are due around the same time, mid to mid April or mid um, March. So that's plenty of time to get your application in, especially if you have already applied to um, allopathic medical school. The website is different. The website, um, well, our application is a comas, so it's A A C O M A S. That is the website you will go to to start your um, application compared to um, MCAS, which is on the AMC website. So that's important to know that for osteopathic medical school, unless it's some schools in Texas, that you will go to that a comas, so A A C O M A S. That is where our application is. And for the most part, the applications are literally almost the same as MCAS. I think there may be a little word count differences with the extracurriculars and the personal statement. But besides that, everything else is the same. Personal information, personal statement, extracurriculars, you need your letters of recommendation. All of that is the same. So if you have any questions or comments or concerns, um, or would you like to learn more about osteopathic medicine? Our SNMA email for our committee is osteopathic, O-S-T-E-O-P-A-T-H-I-C 
at snma.org and we'll feel free to answer any of your questions on how if you want to get more involved with our committee or just if you want to learn more information about it that we didn't answer here feel free to reach out to us because we're always looking for new members to join and just to spread the word about osteopathic medicine especially since the DO merger happened in 2020 um so that's something as well to consider about like the merger, um, residencies and all of that. If no one has anything else to say, I think we'll be done for the evening. Does anyone have anything else they may want to add? No. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys at maybe our next event. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.